Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to our worship service today. It's good to have you here in God's house or joining us on our live stream uh, wherever you may be this morning. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, service of worship as we draw strength from God's Word. We're moving into the final Sundays of the church year. And uh, this week, next week, and the week after, uh, we, our scripture readings will focus us on final things, uh, at least the final things of this world. Uh, our gospel readings will all come from the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, and uh, that chapter begins with a parable and the story of the wedding, the five wise and the five foolish bridesmaids. We'll uh, focus uh, a little more intently on that as the service unfolds, but as you'll hear in the other readings as well, uh, a real strong emphasis on being prepared and being ready uh, for the day of the Lord uh, whenever uh, He comes again in glory. Now, for those of you who are here in the church this morning, the order of service is printed for you uh, in your bulletins. Uh, for those watching the live stream, uh, the liturgy and the words to the hymns will appear on the screen as we go through the service this morning. And I invite uh, those who are here with us in the church to stand as we join together to sing three verses of the hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you. With which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor single. 
Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you for all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed, we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the fifth chapter of Amos. Amos lived at a time when uh, a good part of Israelite society had pretty much uh, forgotten about God, or if they uh, were remembering, it was only for the sake of the rituals and the feasts. Uh, And they often cried out, uh, hoping for the day of the Lord, but Amos warns them that um, if that day were to come upon them, uh, it would not so much be a blessing as a time of darkness and judgment, and he calls them to a new and living faith. Begin reading at Amos chapter 5, verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, with gloom and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look on them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. 
we read from 1 Thessalonians a few weeks back. This is a letter where Paul focuses a lot of attention on the promise of the Lord to return, and specifically here in our reading this morning on uh, that day when the dead are raised and everyone is lifted to new life again uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, words that are to encourage and strengthen us. We begin at verse 13 of chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are left alive, we will be caught up together, with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Ashley's here with an anthem for us this morning. We shall behold him.
As you're able, I invite you to stand for this morning's gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We'll remain standing and join together to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated and we'll join together to sing our hymn of the day, Wake Awake for Night is Flying.
to each and every one of you, God's grace and mercy and peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, those of us gathered here together in the church this morning and those who are watching us on the live stream or a little bit later online. May God's peace be with you. So what is it about those wise yet also selfish bridesmaids? Once upon a time, ten young women were invited to be part of a wedding party in a little town somewhere in Palestine. And the custom was for those young women to be the ones who would go on the wedding day to the home of the bridegroom. And their job was to accompany the bridegroom, to be the procession for the bridegroom as he would make the journey from his parents' home to the home of his bride and her parents. And it's there that the celebration would happen. And you can well imagine these ten young women were probably girls that had grown up together. They'd talked and laughed and maybe even had sleepovers together or whatever people did in those days. They were close friends, probably. Knew everybody in town and everybody knew them. And the day of the wedding comes. And they do what they're supposed to do. They all grab their lamps, they get themselves dressed up, and they head over to the home of the groom. But you know, in 35 years of doing weddings, I think two have started on time. <laughs> and this is not a new phenomenon. We're not told what exactly it is that makes the bridegroom late. Maybe he decided to play one last round of golf as a single man. Maybe his parents had some things they needed to say to him. Or maybe he's just plain disorganized and has trouble getting himself together and ready to go. But in any case, he waits. they wait, these bridesmaids do, for quite a while before he's finally ready to come. And they all doze off, actually. Fall asleep while they're waiting. But then at last... At midnight, the cry goes out. He's ready. The bridegroom is ready now to make that journey to the home of the bride. And there the celebration will begin. And the girls, they all come back to life again. They rub their eyes. They straighten themselves out. They trim the wicks on their lamps. And it's at that moment that five of them realize they're running out of oil. Their lamps aren't going to be able to stay lit they're not going to be a very helpful part of this procession at all. And so they turn to their friends and they say, can we borrow a little oil? I mean, can we just put some in our lamps too so that we can have light as well? And, and the, the, the other girls look at them and say, no, sorry. Because if we do that, then none of us are going to have enough oil. You guys run off to the little shortstop or the 7-Eleven or wherever it is that's open late and selling oil tonight and see if you can get some. But no, we can't share. Now what's with that? Jesus talks a lot about sharing. You know, if somebody asks for your Cloak, uh, give him that one and another one too. And we'll hear in a couple weeks about, you know, everything we do for the less fortunate we've done for Jesus. And Paul goes on about sharing and, and being generous with the things that we have. What's with these five bridesmaids that they're not going to share? Well, Jesus tells us. He sums it all up in a sentence for us at the end of the reading. Watch, therefore, he says, because you know neither the day nor the hour. For a whole chapter, 
before this, Jesus has been teaching his disciples about his promise to return. That he is actually going to come back a second time to this world in judgment and to be the king. And he's talked about some of the signs that will precede that. Now the temptation for most of us is to kind of want to look at the signs. To keep our watching on what's going on all around us. And we've all probably become rather good at that sort of thing uh, in these months of COVID, wherever we happen to live. We all look for some sign that this is getting better. We want to know how much longer it's going to be until the all clear is finally sounded. We can take off the masks. We can sit close together. We can have as many people in our house as we would like. We can get back to something resembling a normal life again. And we watch for the signs. Is the count up today or is the count down today? Are we getting better or are we getting worse? Is this getting closer or is this getting farther away? And by the way, when is the vaccine coming? We're hanging on the horizon and looking and scanning the horizon for something that tells us how long this is going to go on. And it's easy to get into a kind of a similar sort of a thing with the Lord's return. You know, entire cottage industry of Sunday afternoon TV preachers has, has made a living at it for a generation or two now. Of, of, you know, trying to look at every little sign, every little thing that happens, and try to fit it into some sort of grand scheme that they have concocted in their heads about how this is either contributing or not contributing to the ultimate return of the Lord. As I read on the internet this past week, Joe Biden may just be, in fact, the Antichrist. Why? Hang on, this is a good reason. Um, he got 666 delegates to the Democratic National Convention after Super Tuesday. Or, on the other hand, he could just be the 46th president of the U.S. who will someday be succeeded by the 47th, the 48th, the 49th, and the 50th, and, and on and on it goes. You can get caught up in those kind of things that are sort of looking for some sort of sign, some sort of indication that this is the end, that this is, this is fitting the pattern somehow. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Yes, there will be signs. But that's not our main focus. When he says, watch, therefore, he's not talking about watching out there exclusively. He's talking about watching in here, in our own hearts, that the real issue is not when is it going to happen, but are you ready whenever it happens? Just as it was for those bridesmaids. The real issue wasn't at what hour is the groom going to come forth from his home. They knew he would eventually, but they knew they'd probably have to wait. And so what is it then that Jesus is really talking about here? What is it that makes us ready for the Lord when he comes? And we can put the word into one, into the answer rather, into one word. One simple word. Faith. And maybe that gives us a bit of a clue as to why it is that these bridesmaids can't share. I can share the faith with you. I can tell you about what it is that I believe. I can tell you about what the church has believed. I can explain the scriptures to you. I can share that with you, but I cannot believe for you, and you cannot believe for me. Faith is personal. And it's not just any kind of faith. It's not just faith in something uh, out there, some cosmic plan or some intelligent design to the universe that we're in. No, as Paul reminds us in the epistle reading, it's a, it's a faith that is, is focused and that is focused upon one person and one person only, and that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who died and Jesus Christ who rose again for you and for me. That's where he made us ready. 
That's where he took the judgment. That was, in fact, for you and me, the ultimate judgment day. We weren't even there yet in body. But that's where he took the judgment for you and for me. That's where he took my sin and your sin and all of those things that make us unready to receive our Lord. That's where he took all of that upon himself and he died for all of that. so that he might rise again triumphant from the grave and assure us that even if we fall asleep, i.e. die, before he comes again, that we're not ruled out of the party. That simply falling asleep like these bridesmaids doesn't disqualify you from the celebration. No, you will rise again. And that faith that is in you will make you ready. It's not about getting prepared. It's about being prepared, a kind of constant state of readiness, constantly being built up and strengthened. And where does that faith come from? Well, again, it's pretty straightforward. It comes from his word. His word that speaks to us. His word that brings to us all of the love and all of the grace and all of the forgiveness that was poured out for you and for me on Calvary. And that's how we are prepared. By staying in that word. Not just for a few minutes on Sunday morning, but day by day by day. And it can be a hard thing to do. I've, I've even noticed in, in my own life, and maybe I'm preaching as much to me as I am to you here this morning, that with all of the things going on in the world, you know, how long is COVID going to last? You know, are they ever going to get the ballots counted down there in the U.S.? And we know what's going on. Is anything ever really certain? It, it becomes very easy to get caught up in all of that news and in all of that stuff that's going on that just seems so vitally important that we set aside our Bibles, set aside our, our, our devotion. We've got to focus on the relevant and the current. And Well, we'll get back to that someday, but then it becomes very easy to just leave it for another day and another day and another day. And pretty soon we become disconnected. And that faith that is in us begins to wane a little bit. Even in this time where we're not able to gather as we would like physically, this is a time to be in the Word. We shouldn't be fasting on the Word, but feasting on the Word day by day by day to keep our faith strong so that we are ready at all times, not just for the Lord when he comes, but ready for the things that are already coming our way in this world so that we might be able to withstand and to hold fast and to live the kind of lives that show an active faith. You know, in our first reading this morning, the people of Israel in Amos' time, they were kind of all anxious for the day of the Lord the day of the Lord. They wanted the day of the Lord. They wanted some visible manifestation of God's power. But it was a time when they had also strayed very far from God's word. And so Amos has the job of telling them, you know, if if you get what you want here, if you get the day of the Lord, it's not going to be such a party as you think it's going to be. It's going to be a day of judgment and darkness for all of the things that you've done and the distance that is between you and God right now. Be careful what you ask for. And he calls forth from them a faith that's not just based on rituals and sacrifices and songs and liturgies and things like that, but a faith that actually is lived out. A ready faith is a faith that's lived out as justice flows and righteousness flows as we live out that faith, the way Luther describes it in one of the prayers that we pray, usually at the end of the communion service, for as verbose a man as Luther could be, he had also the gift of being able to summarize things up in a sentence every once in a while. 
And in that one prayer that we pray a lot of times after the communion service, we pray simply that the Lord would lead us to live in faith toward Him and in fervent love toward one another. And when we live that way, in that strong, vibrant faith connected to His Word, in a faith that lives itself out in caring for our neighbor as ourselves, then we're ready. Then he's made us ready. Or another way to see it, perhaps, is to realize that we're all part of the wedding party. We're all part of that wedding party that will receive the bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes out from his heavenly home to collect his bride, which is also us. And being part of a wedding party is a kind of a weird experience. You know, I I used to do this quite regularly in my single days. (laughs) And I, I first thought, you know, when I was asked to be in a wedding party, oh, this is a nice little Saturday afternoon gig. You know, you put on a nice suit, you dress up nice, you stand at the front of the church, you try not to do anything embarrassing, and uh, you go to a party afterwards, and uh, if you've done a good job, they give you a little gift or something and thank you, and you're in the wedding pictures for all time and eternity. Was I ever wrong? I mean, wedding, being in a wedding party is no small job anymore. It's gotten worse over the last 35 years. I mean, if you're asked to be in a wedding party, you're now committing yourself to basically giving yourself over for however long it is from whenever you're asked till the wedding happens. You've got to be at this thing. You've got to be at that thing. You've got to be at something else. And then there's this happening and that happening. And you kind of just become sort of like the bond servant of the people who are getting married, it seems. And it can be a big burden. But this wedding party isn't such a burden. It's a whole lifetime of being ready. A whole lifetime of being strengthened in faith and built up in faith so that when the bridegroom comes, we are there ready to meet him, ready to go out in joy to celebrate his coming. Once upon a time, there were ten young women who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. But once upon a time isn't just back there somewhere. It's right now for you and for me. Keep watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. We'll join together to sing the offertory, Create in Me. That's on page 8 in the service folder or that will appear momentarily on your screen at home. be seated.
Welcome again uh, to worship this morning, whether you're here with us in person or joining us online today. Uh, we pray that you are blessed by the service and strengthened in your own faith. Uh, just a few deadlines uh, this week in the congregation for different projects that we're able to continue with. Uh, today is the deadline for bringing back the Operation Christmas Child uh, shoe boxes. Now, if you forgot and you oh my, it's sitting ready at home and I left it there, there's usually a couple of days of grace, um, but then these will be gone by the end of the week and uh, shipped off so that they can join the others and go to the places uh, where they are needed for Christmas time. Also, the youth are doing their pie fundraiser, and Friday is the deadline to uh, get your requests into Lenora so that uh, there will be apple pies for you that can be nice dessert on uh, a winter night in December or Christmas Day or whenever. And we're also beginning uh, for the month of November a clothing drive. Um, we've put a box near the parking lot entrance, and you can stop by the church anytime to donate to that. Um, this is all part of the work that we've been doing uh, with Lot 42. We helped build the tiny houses, a couple of them. And uh, now we're also going to gather some clothes for that little community and for others in our area who uh, may need those things as winter approaches. Uh, this week is supposed to be lovely weather, but you know what month it is, and it isn't going to stay this way forever. So anyway, if you have things that you can donate to that, we'll be happy to receive them here. Uh, and then also this week on Wednesday evening, uh, two Bible classes uh, happening. Uh, of course, the adult Bible class on the book of Job. We'll talk about Job this week and then next week. And uh, that will conclude the Job study. Uh, and uh, that's uh, either online or in person. And uh, everyone's invited to that. And then our youth will also have an online Bible study using Zoom on uh, Wednesday evening. And they're talking about issues around race and uh, those sorts of things which are very uh, current topics in North America right now. And then just a word, too, on Pastor Zabel. He's continuing his uh, uh, recovery at home, and uh, we had a nice chat the other day, and he's coming along. Right, Judy? You're nodding at me. Yeah, okay, that's good. So that's good current news right up to date. He's continuing to recover and hopefully be back before too much longer. I think that's all I need to announce uh, this morning, uh, and uh, again, a welcome to everyone, and uh, our offerings will now be presented. Lord God, we offer to you what you have first given to us, the sacrifices of our time, our talents, and indeed our treasures. We pray, Lord, that you would bless these offerings to the uh, growth and strengthening of your people here and throughout the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In addition to the prayers mentioned in our bulletin this morning, we've been asked to remember Denmar Dagbulo, whose uh, father has suffered a stroke back in the Philippines, and they are uh, making decisions about uh, his care, and uh, Denmar's asked us all to remember them in our prayers uh, this morning. Uh, each of the petitions of our prayer uh, today will end with the words, in, uh, let us pray to the Lord, and your response is, Lord, have mercy. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you are our help and our deliverer, and you bring, to you we bring the prayers and petitions of your people, that you may grant us all things good and needful, and guard us against all things evil and harmful. We pray that the Lord would grant us wisdom and courage, that we may be prepared at all times to receive him when he comes in his glory, 
and that we may not be distracted by earthly glories that fade away or disillusioned by earthly disappointments which will come to an end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the Lord would give courage to all pastors as they preach and teach the word of the Lord, and that all who hear may, be, may believe, and that the pastors and leaders of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of South Sudan and Sudan may be given strength to meet the many challenges they face as they serve people in refugee camps in the midst of illness and strife. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the governments of the world and our leaders would act justly and with mercy, that we may be spared war and violence, and that we may wisely use his gift of freedom, and that we might honor the sacrifice of those who have died or have been wounded in body or in mind while protecting the freedom that we enjoy in this land. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the Lord would give aid and comfort to the sick and the suffering and to those who are in their last days. That he may grant healing according to his will and strength to bear up under the weight of loneliness or affliction. We especially pray for Audrey Pritchard, for Sandy Berg, for Val Toth, for Denmark and his family, for Pastor Roger Winger and Pastor Paul Zabel. We pray also for those who mourn, that we might not grieve as those who have no hope, but may rejoice in the promise of the resurrection to life everlasting, and that we may encourage one another with these words. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may be ready to receive the Lord when he comes in glory. That the Lord may open the hearts of those who have wandered from the faith. That the Lord may restore those caught up in error's maze. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, into your hands we commit these and all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as he has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. remain standing and join together to sing our final hymn this morning, uh, four verses from the hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. <laughs> 